Okay, um, so this talk is not for people to convince them to functional programming. It's for the people who are convinced they should do FP and Scala. They sometimes struggle. And this is sort of like a journey uh, about the pitfalls that you may happen along the way when you well, try to learn about functional programming. Uh, if you haven't seen any encodings, FP encodings in Scala before, you will be uh, surprised and, and not really happy with the presentation. However, if you ever try to do FP and you struggle along the way, maybe this will be something that is helpful to you. All right, so why should we do functional programming anyway? So the selling points, the selling points are following. Modularity, uh, testability, what else? Performance and uh, maintainability. This sounds all super cool. And uh, you know, if I work in a project that has all those points, I would be super happy. So, so yeah, so, all right. So given that, that that's all the stuff that the EFP is promising us, um, well, let's try to build a, a, an FP application. So what it will be the building block? So the thing, when you, you start learning about FP, you, you learn about those little things, like there is an either T. So and, uh, I'm using Scala Z, so there's a disjunction is just, just either. Uh, so either, you know, like, if you don't know what either, disjunction is either A or and B. That's pretty much what we have to think about it. But you, look, you see this and you think, okay, it's either A or B, and nothing else. So, but A or T, is nothing really that really complicated. It's just a wrapper, it's a class that wraps a, a an, uh, disjunction, either A or B, over some F, whatever the F will be, an, an option or, or IO or task or whatever. But it's just a wrapper, nothing else. Same goes for reader. Reader, is some people, if they see it for the first time, they might be confused, but it's not really anything anything complex, really. It's just a function that goes from A to B and it's wrapped, it's just closed over some class, nothing else. Uh, Cliesly, sometimes known as reader T, those are basically the same thing, or it's just a uh, 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 specialization of, of, of reader. It's, it's, it's just a function that goes from A to some B, but that B is closed over some M, over some type constructor. And then you can define, you can define the reader as a Cliesly of ID, where ID, ID is just the little trick. ID of A is just a is just an A. So this is so you can define the reader in terms of class of in terms of reader T. Okay, if you haven't seen that in the past, it looks bizarre and like you'd be like, well, what the hell? But it's nothing really that much complex. It's just a function, some function, whatever, and it's closed over class. The same thing goes for state. State is just yet another function that goes from some S to a tuple, a new S, and some A that is being produced. So state is just a class that wraps this function. Um, come on, and uh, state T is one more time specialization of it. So instead of going from S to SA, we go from S to SA that is closed over some, some N. And one more time, we can define the, uh, the state using state T and D and the ID. So those are the, the building blocks that if you start if you start learning about functional programming and Scala, you will learn about those things. And as I said, if you haven't seen them before, you will be confused. But if you really look at it, it, it compiles essentially. That there's nothing really magical about it other than that you might be asking yourself a question like, what for? Right? But nothing really complex in it. So now, and then when you learn about functional programming, you at some point you get this concept. You understand state monad. You understand Cliesly. You maybe will understand writer and writer T. And then question you ask yourself is, know what? Like I mean, what's next? Because functional programming, like learning about functional programming, looks like this, right? You learn about those building blocks, and then you're like, okay, know what? The tutorials will not help you, and it's a little bit confusing. But anyway. Let's try actually to write an FP application using those building blocks. So the application that we're going to write is, uh, you, uh, the, this font is small, I understand, but the application is simple. It's a weather app. You run it, it will tell you that it's using some service somewhere out there. It will ask you for a city. Uh, I'll, I'll type my city, Wrocław, where I live. It will give me a forecast for that city, a temperature. And also, it kind of each time I call it um, in a loop, it re remembers which city was the hottest, right? So it has some sort of cache, a memory in the runtime. So, so far, 
the hottest city that was found was my city with temperature 28 degrees, but then I ask for London and it gives me like 34 degrees, which is would never happen in the city, right? Um, but let's, let's assume it did. So now the hottest city that is found so far is London. And when I ask it one more time and just provide something weird, which is not really a city, the, the program will just exit, get, telling me that the city, the city with, uh, with this weird name doesn't really exist. So that's the program that we try to, come on, that, that's the program that we try to build. So the domain is pretty much simple. We have some, some uh, unit like Celsius and Fahrenheit. We have, um, crap, we have, sorry, I have to probably use my keyboard, sorry. We have a, a temperature, uh, which, just hold the value of, uh, of a temperature. We have a, a concept of forecast that only has a temperature and a city. Uh, now, we also have a third party client that will, this is the something that we bought uh, from, from some other company that just does the forecast for us. So we give it a city and it, it gives us a forecast for a given city. And we also have some helper classes because we need to deal with configuration. Like we would like to know when you run our program, we would like to connect to that uh, third body with, with a host and port. We have to the reason about the error. So the only error that we have in our application is the unknown city. And uh, last thing, as you remember, when I was calling the application and I was asking for different cities, it was remembering all the cost calls that I did so far. It, it was remembering all the forecasts that it's seen so far. And it was always able to give me the hottest city so far. So I have this type alias request, which is just a map for a city and forecast. And this is sort of like a cache to which we will store the values while the program is running. Okay, some imports which are necessary. So I'm using Monix to do the IO, I'm using Scala Z, uh, and I have to do use uh, Daniel Spivak streams in order for those two to align because, well, Monix is using CATS and Scala Z is Scala Z, so. Anyway. Uh, so what do we need? In order to build our application, we, we need to have an ability to fetch the host and port from the configuration. We need to have an ability to reason about like input and output, so ask the user for the input in console and also print some result to the console as well. We need to go from the city name that the user gives us to the actual city, and there might be errors, as, you, as you've seen, because the user might type arbitrary things, so there might be situations where a user writes something which doesn't really represent any city at all. And also we need to call our third party and we need to have ability to reason about the hottest city. All of those points we would like to do in an FP way because of the modularity, maintainability, testability and performance, all the nice things we would like to have in our code base. All right, so given the building blocks that we've seen so far, this is pretty much straightforward. So for example, host and port, I could have two functions, host and port, which just gives me a reader. And as you remember, reader is just a function that goes from configuration to a string or from configuration to an int. So I can provide those functions close to the reader and they give me what I really need. Same for input output. Input output, I would like to, well, printing stuff to console and reading stuff from console is effectful, but I could lift that into task from Monix and this becomes an, an, uh, sort of like a um, recipe of what should be done. It's when you call this function, it doesn't really do anything, it's just give you a task that will essentially do the thing for you once you, event, once you run it at some point. Uh, what about city by name? Well, I have to, I would like to go from a, a city name to a city, but sometimes there might be an error. So if it's, it's a road stuff or London, I, I give you a city, but if, uh, Anything else, I just tell you, well, unknown city, right? I have an ability to reason here about the errors with my little disjunction. Now, one more time, disjunction is like an either type, uh, normal either type in Scala. So, it's it. All those functions that we've seen so far are pure functions. Well, what about that third party? Well, the same things as with console and any effectful code and my weather client, the, 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 the app that I bought, uh, is effectful, um, I can always lift it into task. So when you call the weather function for a given city, it will not instantiate, it will not call the forecast method, it just gives you a task, it gives you a recipe of what should be done once you finally run it. And finally, we have a function which we call hottest city. So this, uh, as you remember, the hottest city 
supposed to remember all the calls that we did so far and give us the hottest cities of all we've we've seen so far and that we can use one of the building blocks that we've seen already the state monad so given that i have a uh, a state monad uh, i could uh it's basically given i have requests i could call a for a given request i could get the heart of city i would not modify the request but i would give you the current the current temperature it works and compiles based on those building blocks now i can create finally start to create something a little bit complex. The, the, the modularity, the composability that you get apparently from FP, it's just, this is the selling point from functional programming, is that you have those little small things, they work, you can, te they, you can test them, you can, you can have a, a assurance that they are robust, and on top of it, you can start building something more complex. The method AskCity is one of those functions where that method will give you a city and uh, the, the, the the name of the study and the way it, it, it runs is that it calls the print line, the function that we defined already, and read and, and, and read line and just gives you a, a, a city. It's a simple for comprehension, nothing really straightforward. Uh, Reference with the complex, uh, quite straightforward. Now, fetch forecast, it's a little bit more already complex, bizarre, and like we look at it, it looks weird and should because it, it is weird. But we, if if we try to sort of compile this in our head. It, 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 it kind of does, it, because the, the thing that we do is we try to fetch a forecast for a given city, and what it does, it, it try to get a forecast for a given city. If, it, if the forecast exists, uh, then, then we're good. Like, so if, um, if it exists, then we're good. If it exists in, the, in our cache, then we're good. If it doesn't exist, well, then we will have to call our third party over here, and at the, at the last step, we will just modify our states, our list, our map of requests with the forecast that we got. So we either will overwrite something we already have, or we will put a new entry into our map. It already looks weird, but it's not that really complex. If you if you start if you were working with uh, state T in the past, essentially it will compile in your head, and you kind of have an ability to reason about the code that you see. Now. This is our final program, right? And it, if you look at it, it's not really that complex. It's actually quite nice. So we ask for a city, we get a city name. We then go from city name to a city because we have this method city by name. We fetch host and port from configuration. We call forecast with our method that we have so far and we give it a city and the host and port that we get previously. We print out the results. Uh, also, we print the hottest city that we uh, we, we fetch the hottest city that we've, that we've seen so far, and we print it out. Now, this this method ask, fetch, and judge will be run forever. So this is the final program. We, we fetch the host and port, we print out the the title of our application, and then the, the previous method that we've seen so far here, we will just run it forever, and it will run it a loop until the point somebody add something that, that doesn't really is in the real city and the application will quit. Now this looks quite okay. The only problem is it will not work. It will not compile. We can make it to compile, but it will look like this, right? And uh, and, and the other program like that. What? I'm, it's no joke. Like if if you ever been a previous Java developer, you sort of accustomed to deal with boilerplate. But and then you'll probably find the important stuff somewhere here. But let's face it, this is horrible. This is like, this is ugly. And, and if anybody would like to work with a software like that, I don't know, like you like pain. <laughs> so, so the FP uh, functional programmer sounds like a medieval monk denying himself the pleasures of life in hopes that it will make him more virtuous. So I said FP will give us those four points, modularity. So do we have it? Like, nah, -uh. like we have different functions which we could reason about, but when we try to combine them, that sucks. It produces a lot of weird code which we don't understand. The stability, I have no idea how we ever test that. Performance, the performance sucks. If you run the benchmarks, this program will be at least order of magnitude slower than its imperative version. So what's the point? And maintainability, as I said, like if you try to maintain this software, I don't know. Um, 
Okay, so, uh, but essentially, if we look at the method that we, we created here, in order to this method that is for this function to compile, even though we know it's ugly and it's awful, right? We need to have, this method needs to work with a type, I call it here an effect, but that type has to accommodate all the functionalities that we've seen from different functions. So it has to reason about state, because one of the functions, they call a city, was reasoning about state. It has to reason about the configuration, have an ability to read configuration, because one of the methods were reader team, um, and they were reasoning about configuration. We need to have an ability to re reason about errors, and also we have the ability to lift arbitrary effectful uh, code into a, 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 a value. So in order to accommodate all those different effects, we build the stack of state T, of reader T, of ERT, of task. And um, okay, and then we, then we have the effect type, which, which accommodates all those things. And uh, then the, the main program isn't really that horrible if you look at it. So, so this is our configuration, the list of requests that you know the city to forecast is at the moment empty. We define our program that we've seen so far, and just, we just say it's effective unit. We need a scheduler for, for the Monix task for it to work. And then we, we take this application and we run it. We, we run it with the initial empty requests. We run it with the configuration. We call a run on the, on the either type that finally gives us a task on which we reason about if the error happened or maybe the error didn't happen. And then lastly, we can call unsafe run sync, which will just kick on the computation. This is the end of the world. This doesn't look that bad. Everything else is just horrible. The question is, can we do better? Well, we can. So let's try. So, so one more time, what do we need? We need exactly the same things, but just done a little bit better. We've seen previously host and port functions that were supposed to give us a host and port based on configuration implemented like that. What's the problem with this function? The only single problem with those functions are the following. You are, I mean, we are making the decision upfront for the caller. Like we're saying, oh, we, we're gonna return you that host and we will fetch the configuration and we'll have that, we'll grasp this concept using reader. But somebody else might not be using reader. They might be using reader T. They might be using state T of reader T of whatever. We don't know how the method is being called. Even, but beside that, we actually are, make, we are making a decision for the user, for the caller, that, well, actually, we're going to reason about the, the configuration using reader. That's the decision that we are making a little bit too fast and not necessarily. What we would really like to have is a signature that looks like this. Listen, I will give you a, ho a host or port closed over some F. I have absolutely no idea, no idea what the F is, okay? You decide, you as a caller of my function has ability to tell me what the F is gonna be. I don't know, I don't care. Well, if we have a signature or a method like that, well, that would be pretty awesome, but there's no way for us to, to, to implement this. We have no ability to reason about configuration, anything like that. It would be nice to have a signature like that, but it's, it's just too abstract. We don't know nothing about F. It could be an option, it could be a task, it could be anything. There's no way for us to reason about it. There's a fortunately type class that will help us. And the type class is called applicative ask. Applicative ask is parameterized by some F and E E stands for environment. So in our example, the E is the uh, is the configuration. So I made here a little type alias called config ask. So applicative ask is a type class that only gives us one single thing: configuration. So E closed over some F. Now, how does it work? We don't know, and that's the beauty of functional programming. We don't have to know. We don't care because what we really do in our program is we say that I will give you the host or the port closed over any F. Well, not any F, not any arbitrary F. The F that is constrained by applicative ask for configuration. So, so for this, given that you give me this, 
given that you, for your f, you will give me an instance of that. I don't know what that is. I have absolutely no idea how that is implemented. But I know if you call this function, the instance of this object exists in the scope. I have access to this. If I have access to that, I have an access to method ask, will give me, which will give me an f of configuration. Or I have an access to method reader, which will give me an f of some a, as long as I have a function that will go from <laughs> configuration to that a. And this function reader, this is what I'm actually using here. So to, just to implement this function, I only have to take advantage of the fact that I have access to just this single type class, nothing else. And I know this will give me the stuff that I need. It will give me the configuration closed over some f, and I, from that I can, I can retrieve the host or the port. But the beauty about this solution is that I still don't know what the f is. I have absolutely no idea how this works. I only know that the f is going to be somewhere out there once somebody calls this function, and the instance of this little type class will exist when, the, when, this, when my functions are being called. City by name, the other function that we had, we, we wanted to reason, that we wanted to give a city for, for a given string, but we also had to reason about the error. One more time, the story is sort of the same. One more time, we made the decision up front. We need to reason about error, that's obvious, but we made the decision that's going to be a disjunction. It's going to be either error or city. It would be nicer if the signature was the following. I will give you a city closed over some f. I have no idea what the f is, but I know the f can reason about errors. Well, could we implement that? Well, if we, if we only reason about the happy path, so what if we have my town, Wrocław, or London, then we just can create an instance of city, and given that we have an instance of applicative, we can lift that city into an f of city, and that works just fine. But what about the error? What if I actually have to raise an error here? What can I do? Well, the story is sort of the same. There's a type class for that. And the type class is called applicative error. So the applicative error, so the E here stands for the error. Given that you give me an error, I will give you an F of A. One more time, you as a, and, and here in our example, the, the E is our error from our domain. So one more time, we as the this creators of this function, we are only saying, listen, I will give you a city close over f. I need to have ability to reason about errors, but because I don't know what the f is, and I don't really care, I don't want to know, you just have to, I'm, I'm just constraining your f. I'm not allowing you to use any f. I'm only allowing you to use f that is actually constrained, meaning that it has an applicative, sorry, an applicative error instance for an f. And then I can just call it rise and error with an unknown city, and it will just work. Same, same story one more time, the hottest city. Here in this function, we, were, we wanted to reason about state, because this function is uh, supposed to get an access to a, a, a request. So this is a map city to forecast. And from that map, we would like to get the hottest city, and we would like to return the temperature of the hottest city. Now, one more time, we made the decision up front for the users, because we say, like, OK, I need to reason about state. But one more time, I made a decision I'm going to use the state, regardless of how this function is going to be used. One more time, the story is exactly the same. So, so I would like to return you a city and temperature close over some f. Well, how can I implement that? One more time, there's a type class for that. And type class is called monad state. It gives us all these little functions. It gives us the ability to reason about the state. So the only thing that we know is that we know that the f, whatever the f is going to be, will have an ability to reason about the state. Somehow, it might be a state. It might be state D. We don't know, but we don't really care. And what's the s? Well, it's in our example, the s is request. Given that, we can implement our function. We can just say, you know, inspect, and, and this, is the, this is the inspect from the monad state function. So um, it's already late, so I'm trying to move forward with this code examples. But it, if, if it doesn't really compile in your head right now, 
it's sort of the same story with all the other type classes that we've seen so far. The story is the following. I want to reason about the state here, and I want to give you back the value close over some f, but because I don't know what the f is, the user will actually decide what the f is. The user also has to give me some hints how I can reason about state. Given that, okay, so this style that you've seen so far is something that you might sometimes uh, hear or read as called as an MTL. Now, there, there are two other functions that we've seen in our program. The other one was uh, print, print, uh, input and output, so print line and read line. Now, the problem is there is no such thing that because MTL was already defined, it's already defined in CATS, it's already defined in Scala Z, those type classes exist. Now, what about input and output? Now, that's a, a tricky part because there's no such thing, right? If it doesn't exist, you can create it. So the only thing that you have to do is create your own little type class. Just create a type class that's called, called console with two methods, read line and print line. We don't know what it really represents. We only know it will have an ability to read line and print line to the user, depending on what the console really is. It might be your terminal, but it might be something else, maybe some, I don't know, some web app or whatever. Given that, we can constrain, for example, our ask city function telling it, well, it's going to be some f, it has to be a monad, but it also is going to be a console, so it ha we, we get the access to the print line method and the read line method, and we can create the ask city method for free. One more time, we at this point, we don't know, have absolutely no idea how the console is going to work, and we don't care. The only thing that we know, it's going to work. How? Whatever. In order to implement this method, I only need to have ability to tell something to the user and get the information back from the user. How the internals will work, I don't really care. Uh, what about the weather? Well, it's exactly the same story. Instead of, you know, we don't have a type class for it, let's create one. So we just create a weather forecast and, and then we can use it. So this approach that you've seen is called something that you'll you will find in liter literature uh, called tagless final. So and then an MTL could be considered just a, a subset of something more general that, that uh, uh, tagless final really is. Now, back to our final program. This four comprehension that you see here will actually work and will actually compile. Because the, our ask, fetch, and judge function, we are saying we're gonna, this method will do something, it actually returns a unit that does a little bunch of things, and it's gonna work under some type f, and we still don't know what the f is. We only know that the f is constrained. At this point, we need to have a reason about, the reason about console, so input and output, we need to have an ability to, to fetch the weather somehow, somewhere out there, a reason about state, the errors, and that's it. And then all those methods will work with this arbitrary f. Same thing goes for the final program. One more time, we call it with all those constraints that we really need here, and we call our ask, fetch, and judge function. This is readable, I would say, uh, I hope, okay, I guess, um, and it actually compiles. So now, let's try to write, this is so we are right now at the end of the world. This is the main function. This is where we, this, this program here, this, this method, we would actually would like to run it. In order to run it, we have to say what the f is, essentially. So what we have is, as, as we had before, initial configuration, we have the empty list of requests, we have some type effect, let's see in a second what that actually is, but given that we define what the effect is, we can call the program and we can specify the f. Finally, here we are saying what the f is. We're saying the f is effect. Now the question is what the effect is. Okay, so could effect be a just a task from Monix? And that will be it, and we're done. Well, let's, let's think about it. We know all the constraints that are needed for our application to work. We need to reason about the weather we need to have an instance of the weather type class. And we can provide that instance, and it's pretty straightforward. We just, we created the, the third party client, and whatever somebody calls the forecast, we just call the client, and it's, and it's closed over task. 
So it it complies with the type signature from the from the weather weather type class where it just needed the weather type class asks us to provide the instance for this function or asks to give us an f in this particular scenario the task of forecast so we can do that okay so so far so good what about the console we need to have an ability to, to reason about the uh, input and output and one more time we can create an instance on, of console pretty easily. We just take the existing uh, read line and print line from Scala and just wrap it into task. And we have an instance of that type class given for us for free. So we have that. But now the, the, our program also needed to reason about state. We well, re needed reason to reason about reading stuff from configuration. We to reason about the errors. Well, in order to reason about state, we could just say the, the type is just the state t of task because there is an instance of monad state for a state t. We get the instance of monad state for free. We don't have to do anything, write any additional code. It's in the library. So we can just say the effect is state t of task. Well, what about configuration? Well, we, we still need to have the, the reader. And what about the errors? Well, there's the either t type. This compiled and works. Now, uh, and we can just essentially run it at the very end. Now, okay, so what about modularity? Do we have it? I would say we do. Because now you've seen that we have those little pieces, little functions like host and port and the hottest city and uh, all other different functions, city by name. You could reason about them separately and you can lift them and combine them into a more complex program without losing anything. And you would know that if that works, the more complex program will also work. What about testability? Uh, what about testability? Well, think about how would you test this function that the ask fetch and job, where you ask for a city from the console and then uh, you go from city name to a city and then you call forecast and then you do something. Well, previously in imperative language that would be pretty hard, but with this approach in your unit tests. You can provide, we, we've seen console, instance of console that was implemented for our production. We could easily provide an instance of this type class console that would be a lot simpler just for our unit test. We could provide a, an instance where print line doesn't really do anything, let's say, for example, just, just returns a unit, but read line always gives us a constant string. Let's say London. London how many times you call it, it will just give you London, London, and London. And then you can create your unit test where you can easily define all those little constraints, how they're going to act for your little, for your little um, scenario that you're working on right now. And you can test this function uh, given different constraints behaving differently for, the, for, the, for, your, for your given scenario. So testability in this approach is is amazing like I haven't seen a better way to test your code than using the tagless final approach <coughs> what about performance well performance sucks and the reason about uh, well, the reason why that is is that we are still using those monad transformer stack um, if you build the either T or reader T of state T of whatever's and then not like all well, you have an existing thing now try to call flat map on it the way flat map is going to be implemented is just going to unwrap the the the, the reader uh, sorry the either t the reader t the state t get a value and wrap it up and with every flat map call it will have to do all that magic up and down that's one thing so you 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 deal with a lot of problems on your heap but also the JVM will freak out uh, and uh, it will just perform badly so the performer still sucks in terms of maintainability I would say this approach is pretty maintainable what we we have right now. There's one last frontier here, and the question is, can we do better? Do I have 10 minutes? Yes. Yeah, all right, cool. So, can we do, as I said, I, I apologize, I probably do have had too many IPAs before this talk, but <laughs> the question is, can we do better? Now, the beauty about this approach is that we exactly know where the, pr where the problem is. The problem is here, in the monad transformer stack question is can we do something about it and the other question is 
if we're going to write now with factor this code, how much changes are going to be needed in our business logic, in our program? And uh, spoiler alert, none. We are only changing the, the, the end of the world, the main function. So check this out. Uh, previously, uh, previously we had we said like okay we need to our program needs to reason about state and I said oh let's just use state t because we get an instance of monad state of the type class that I used before in my business logic I get an instance of that monad state for free the state t implements has the instance for that type class and that's why I used it I was lazy but now. I don't really have to use state t in order to, pro to give you an instance of monad state. Here's a very naive, and I, I made it naive for the simplicity of the overall presentation, but here is a naive implementation of monad state, of the type class that we are using within, within our program, that is using atomic. Atomic comes from monix. And, and just don't focus, just believe me, it compiles. It gives us all the methods that we need in order for monad state to work, and it works on atomic reference. We don't need a state t in order to get a monad state of task, okay? We can give an instance of monad state for task using just dot, and we don't need the state t. So, um, so in this example, we can just remove this line. We can provide, we need, we'll need to provide an instance of an atomic monad state, an instance of this, of this class. But given that we, we give that over here, we, can, we are removing this line. We're removing state t. So our effect right now is just the reader t of either t of task. And we provide the monad state instance here explicitly using atomic reference. What about reader t? As I said, I need an instance of applicative as. That's the type class that I'm using within, within, my, within my program, applicative as. Reader t gave me an instance for free, but one more time I was lazy. I don't have to provide that instance with reader t. What I can actually do is give you a very, this is a very uh, general implementation of applicative as using some constant value e. So given that you have some e, let's say configuration, it will give you an instance of applicative ask and, and it will just work. So one more time, we can remove this line and we just provide the, the uh, applicative ask with that implementation that I've seen a moment ago. And now, the performance is almost as good as the imperative code that we would written, you know, using some imperative style of, of, of writing our software. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving the, the, the asterisk here because I said it's almost as good. It's not perfect, but wait, just it, before we move forward, just once, let's, let's speak about what, about what just happened right now. I haven't touched the business logic at all. The performance sucked. We understood where it sucked. But the only place we had to reason about it and do some additional changes was the end of the world. We only need to have provide better instances of our type classes, nothing else. Do you see the beauty of that? Like, and one more time, the question is, that, so the performance is better, and the, so the, the asterisk here is, well, it's not as good as imperative work. One more time, the question is, can we do better? Our last frontier is the either t of task. Our effect is either t of task. You want to be as close to task as possible. So you might be asking me a question, well, so why you didn't do this trick with you did before? Why didn't you do that with just the either t? Now the problem is you cannot write an instance of applicative error for task. That is not doable. There is a trick that you could do. The task from Monix has a method rise error as long as the error is throwable. So if I said my error type extends throwable, 
then I could provide an instance of applicative ask, and then my final effect would be just task. And I did that, and performance was amazing, was as fast as imperative code base. But, but that's not what you really want. Because if you say the error in your program extends throwable, then you screw. The whole idea about defining the algebraic data type of error, like so you define a list of errors here, so then somebody will erase an error's error over here. So somewhere else in your code base, you get an error, and you can do a pattern match against this error, and you know the list of the errors was defined here, and you just have to reason about all the possible errors that might happen. If your error extends throwable, then you're screwed and you cannot really do anything about it. So we don't really want to do that. But if we did that, our code base would be really, 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 really fast. Uh, so the performance, there's the other problem is the, now if you have this type which is an either T of task, now we have two channels where you have to reason about error. One channel is that either T might just give you a left value, right? And that's one of the errors that you can get. The other problem that you may have is that the task itself can just throw an arbitrary exception. So whenever you deal at the end of the world with your either T of task, you have to reason and think about two different channels of how the errors might, might could have it happen in your application, which really, 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 really sucks. The holy grail is I.O., by factor I.O., something that, that John DeGos is promoting. It's also available in CATS. The idea here is that the I.O. task is exactly the same thing, ability to lift any arbitrary computation into a, an, an a, a object, a value. But instead of this being parameterized by A, you parameterize it also by A and E, by error. Now think about it for a second. Not only you get, now given this type signature, you can lift, you can, create an instance of applicative error for this type. So our final effect is going to be I.O. and it's going to be super fast. It's going to be as fast as your imperative code base. But also it gives you a lot of additional features. So think about it. If you have an I.O. of nothing, where the E is nothing, then you know that your program will never, ever have errors. If you have I.O. of E and A is nothing, then you know your program will never give you a value. Just from the type signature, you know that the program runs forever. It never is producing a value. Think about it. Think about it for a second. You have an arbitrary imperative code, which you inherited from some third party. You, you, it, it might give you a string. It promises that it will give you a string. But you don't really know what it actually does. It might throw some exceptions, right? Previously with task, you would take this imperative code and you would lift it into task and you would say, oh, this is a task of string. And that's it. That imperative code could, could throw exceptions, your task would throw exceptions, and you're screwed. With IOTA, you can, whenever you lift some code that you don't understand, right, and you don't know what may happen, you might say it's an IO of throwable and string. Just by type signature, you're saying, listen, this might just throw some exceptions, throwables. Then it's for the user to go from throwable to some errors that you defined. There will be other effectful computation, like for example, sometimes you, you just want to know what the time is. You call system current time millis, right? This function is effectful, but it never breaks. Never throw, uh, if current times throw an exception, it throws an error, it's probably is your, your, your memory is screwed, your RAM is screwed, your JVM broke, or but something is like arbitrarily super weird is happening with your operating system. So there's no way to sort of deal with that. If you take an effectful computation that you will ne you know you, it will never throw an exception, you can just say nothing. So you get additional information to the type signature, to the color of your functions, which is, which is pretty neat, that's, but that's probably something for, for another talk. The nice thing about it is from, from the perspective of my presentation is just the fact that you can now use the I.O. as your final effect type and your code will be maintainable, testable, uh, it will be modular, so composable, but it will also be freaking, freaking fast as your imperative code base. So that asterisk can disappear. 
let's let's move from the announcements. Well, my name is Pablo Schulz, and let's have some beers. Thank you very much.